one more thing this last one if god intervened in human choices we wouldn't be free and nathan did a really good job bringing this up earlier about um the difference between like a permissive parent that has no boundaries or rules and then the helicoptering parent that is just all over their kids business where they can't do anything without supervision or monitoring and we can all see the disastrous effects of both of those models right of complete permissiveness or complete control and what that does to the individual we're trying to raise and in order for us to become mature and adults Part of it is we have to suffer and we have to scrape our knees. We have to bump our nose every now and again. We have to know that fire is hot and the street is dangerous. And that's where it gets difficult. And when I took philosophy of religion at San Diego State and we were talking about this, um, I brought up the example of, yeah, but if you were a parent and you had a fenced-in protected yard and garden that you were letting your kids play in and you knew there was this deadly serpent in the garden that wanted to bring harm to your children's would you allow that to be in the garden if you had the ability to remove it and from my human fred perspective i'm like of course not i would go out and remove that serpent before i let my children play in the yard i mean that's just basic but then the professor countered with well how much do you want God to intervene? I mean, where's the line? Where's the limit? And that's where we get back to, to the degree that God intervenes, humans lose freedom. Does that make sense? And a lot of the evil that happens in the world is what humans do to other humans. But do you really want God to take away human choices so that they cannot harm other humans. I mean, you might want to say, well, yeah, I would like that. But if you keep going down that path, humans would become just kind of like automatons or just these program things in this perfect world that God has designed. And part of back to the, the Garden of Eden and the fall of man, I personally think part of that was to show us our need for God, of uh, how we can't figure this out on our own. As much as that atheist painted that beautiful picture of atheism and how free and wonderful it would be if we didn't believe in heaven or hell anymore and we could all just be nice to each other, that doesn't seem to be the reality of the human condition. And I think part of the fall and this disobedience of God and then being under the curse is now we realize our complete dependence of God and not only can we not live up to God's standard of good and evil in the scriptures, I don't know about you all, I can't even live up to my own personal standard of good and evil, let alone God's standard. I can't. I fall short of Fred's standard every day. And that's part of what I have to remind myself too, because that's where I, I personally believe guilt and shame comes from. I don't think that comes from God. I think that comes from us not living up to our own internal standard of how we're supposed to be. And I believe what comes from God is conviction, but with conviction also comes the power to change. And guilt and shame is just kind of like a weird ego trip where we kind of beat ourselves up for not living up to ourselves. Any thoughts, comments on that? God gave us a conscience. We, we have our conscience of, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, conscience of um, doing things that are wrong too. It's like, I know some people kill it when they do too much evil, but a lot, most of the time we do have that feeling of, geez, I did something I shouldn't have really done. Conscience is a tricky thing though, Sandy. <laughs> because is conscience coming from God or is it coming from culture? Is it how we were brought up and enculturated or indoctrinated? Or is that actually something inside of us? Is there like an internal template or compass? And let me give you an example. Um, I was brought up, thank you, mother. Uh, my mother's here in the room, so I'm going to watch myself. 
I was brought up very conservative, fundamentalist Baptist. And when we were going to church on Sunday, we were going to God's house and you were to dress like it and you were to act like it. So we would be bathed, fed, clean, ready to worship. I had special Sunday clothes. I only wore to church. I had Sunday dress shoes that my dad made me polish every Sunday morning before I went to church. And it was all out of this sense they were trying to create in me this sense of awe and wonder of God and a, a reverential approach when we went to church. Well, years later, I, um, as an adult, I started visiting this church in San Diego called Grace Fellowship. And being in Southern California, these people look like they were going to the beach right after church. I mean, they're wearing shorts and Hawaiian shirts and flip flops and and all this. And I just, the contrast with that and my upbringing was quite profound. And I remember thinking, wow, if I go to church dressed how I was brought up to go to church, I'm just going to stand out. And so I'll never forget the first Sunday I decided not to wear dress shoes to church and I was going to wear tennis shoes. I was shaking putting on my tennis shoes and I was sure I was going to get in a car accident on the way to church or something like that for disrespecting God. And I went to church, I made it home and nothing happened. And I was like, whoo, well, guess what? Next Sunday, okay. it was a whole lot easier to wear tennis shoes instead of dress shoes. And like I de-enculturated myself and entered into a new culture. But it sure felt like my conscience inside that was saying, what are you doing? Why are you being so rebellious? And I'm having this argument with my conscience saying, no, I'm not being rebellious. It's just, it's a different circumstance. It's a different situation. Um, I don't think God really cares what kind of shoes I'm wearing. I think he's more concerned mm -hmm. with what kind of heart I'm bringing. Yep, it's in your heart. But um, that's an example of why it's hard to even trust our own conscience because a lot of things we may think are right or wrong really aren't coming from God or the Holy Spirit, but they're coming from our culture or the way we were brought up or taught. Okay. One of the things that I learned in, in church growing up was that like, yeah, you have a conscience, but at the same time, like your conscience has to like line up with what the Bible says. So like, you have your conscience, but then you line you line it up with, with what Scripture says. And this, the like a couple of years ago, there was something in California like about freedom of religion. And uh, one of the things John MacArthur had said is that like this whole argument and debate about freedom and free will is a very, uh, you know, it's a very American thing. He's like in other co countries that have never had any freedom in their government, they they don't have these types of arguments and. Uh, basically what he said is that God's ideal type of government is a theocracy. A theocracy. <laughs> yeah, like, like the Jews um, with the tabernacle yeah. and all of that, and that his ideal would be a theocracy now. You know, not not uh, out, you know, like in American government, like mandating, you know, uh, essentially Christianity and, and things of that nature, which I thought was very interesting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that could be a whole class all to itself, right? And I would agree intellectually and theologically. A theocracy is the best form of government we could have. And you don't exactly vote for theocracies, right? That's not how they come about. <laughs> I'd be all for voting for a theocracy, but I would have to have the qualifier without human representation. Because we've had theocracies in the past, and at least in my historical knowledge, they have all gone horribly bad. Wasn't where Moses, you have a human speaking as the voice of God. Wasn't that Moses? Moses had kind of a theocracy going, and the judges and But he was the representative, right? Like he'd yeah. go talk to God on the mountain. Yeah. And so you sure hope Moses was saying what God said, right? And not what Moses was thinking. And that's the problem with the theocracy with the human representative. Are are they being true to, is God really speaking through them? Or are they adding in their own stuff to go along with it? Mm -hmm. 